Hi everyone, this video will cover Kenya's neighbor classifier part 1. Here we'll go over the idea behind Kenya's neighbor, we get the intuition and the mathematics and look into the algorithm. Okay, so let's get started. The idea is given a test record for which we want to classify, we assign the majority class of it, its neighbor as the classifier as uh, output. Okay, so what does that mean? So first let's get the intuition of how humans operate, then we'll define it more in the machine learning terminology. So let's assume we've been given a toy that looks more like one of the birds, which is on the right side, and then we also have the population of different birds. Our goal is to associate this particular toy with the right bird, or at least the one which has the most match, okay? If that's the case, then we go through three steps in the process. Step one is we have been given a data of the population with which we are going to be inferring the details. Number two is we do have an ability to understand the structure, which means we look at the features of the particular birds whether they are their feathers, the way they swim, the way they move along, and correlated with the particular toy. And then the third thing we obviously do is once we know those features, we are trying to associate the features with the toy, and we try to make a prediction saying this toy is actually resembling a duck or a swan. Okay, so that's how we go through it. Now, if we were to put that into machine learning terminology, the population given to us from which we infer are the training records. The structure we do is identifying the features and also computing the distance between the test record and each of the element in the population or the training records. And then the third step is we choose k of the nearest records. If we were to choose only one, that is also feasible, but here we choose k of the nearest records and we'll understand why in a minute so now let's go around and formalize this a little better so we can start putting in some more of our math behind in a couple of minutes the first thing is here we have been given minus and plus points and we can see that with all these three graphs they are identical except for the X, which is the test record, and the circle surrounding that. Okay. The test record still remains the same across all the charts, but the circle actually starts becoming bigger to include more and more neighbors. Okay. So in the first chart, we have only one nearest neighbor, based on which we are going to be inferring the details. So in this particular case, the nearest neighbor is a negative, therefore the X would be uh, in a minus class, okay? But if we were to consider not just one neighbor, but two of the nearest neighbors to infer our class details, then in this particular case, there is a tie between a minus sign and a plus sign. Therefore, we cannot directly make an inference out of this. However, in this video, we will cover the mathematical details of how to kind of resolve this scenario. So for now, just understand that we don't like the ties. That's one of the reasons why we tend to choose odd numbers for nearest neighbors. Okay. Next, this diagram, we have chosen three nearest neighbors for x, which happens to be one negative number and then two positive numbers, which are falling within the circle, red circle. And in this particular case, obviously, we will be taking it plus as the sign, as the class of X, because the majority class is positive, okay? So one important note that we have to understand here is we look at the neighbor or the neighbors based on our configuration, and we take the majority class to be the class of the given test record, okay? Now, let's define this, whatever we have just discussed, more mathematically, all right? So now let's look at this math. So f, f hat of q, this is the kind of output we are trying to find out, which is the function for which we want to identify the 
class. What we're trying to do is we are trying to take an arg max of a sum of another function. Okay. Now the arg max function would give us the index of the maximum element. Okay. And then what we are iterating across is the number of neighbors around which we want to identify the the nearest or the most happening majority class. Okay. And then this particular function, draw taking a function, uh, taking a parameter v and an f of xi, what it really is indicating is your similarity measure. Okay. So v is our input and f of xi is the training set for which we are trying to find the number of nearest neighbors, which is why we are iterating over i for up to k neighbors. Okay, so for each of the data element, we are going to see the closest or the most similar data points with our input, and the majority class of that particular input is being returned as the output of the overall function. So that's the intuition behind this math. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that when the k is 2 in this particular case, or even, there can be a tie between two of the classes if there are only two classes involved. So in such cases, what we typically do is we go with something called as a weighted KNN. Okay, so weighted KNN formulation is straightforward. What it is actually doing, let's come back here to this chart and take a look at the intuition first, is that it's saying, look, negative minus is very close to X, plus is a little bit far away, but then the other points are way far out. So therefore, when considering the weightage of minus and plus, we weight the minus more because it's much closer than the plus which is a little bit far away okay so that's the intuition now if we were to put that in math for the earlier equation which was this equation what we have done is we have basically taken an inverse distance between the points so inverse distance between the input point xq and the in xi which is each of them so this this is x xq then we are trying to take a distance between xq and minus point and xq and plus point and we are weighting that in an inverse way we have just squared it but overall all we have done is we have taken an inverse weight and what it means is the far away points will get a less weight and the nearest points will get more weights okay so that's what weighted KNN does. Now, the algorithm itself, though, is very simple. Now, let's talk about the non-weighted version of KNN, which is so that we get a little bit more detail on the components to it, the components involved in this function. What is important to know is there are two elements in this components, in this algorithm, that are critical for us. We choose them, and we have to choose them right for our methods to work. First is the choice of K. Okay. The second one is the distance measure. Okay. So first, the choice of k is if we choose the value of k too small, then we will be sensitive to noisy, noisy points. So if we choose only one in this particular case, it just so happens it's choosing the, the negative data, the data set, data point, and classified this x to be negative. But that also means we will be increasing the variance a lot. The next important thing to know is if k is too large, let's say the k is the majority score, then the neighborhoods will actually include way too many points. And that might not make much sense either. So if you look at this particular example, the x is right in the middle, and it is being sur surrounded by the plus signs. And what's actually happening is the Plus signs are the actual class for which we want to try and classify the x. However, because we've chosen the radius to be very large, 
the negatives also come into the picture. In fact, the negatives are become a majority class, and it is very highly likely that X gets classified as negative. Okay. So to avoid this from happening, we need to choose K very carefully. And one of the rules of thumb for choosing K is we want to choose it based on the square root of N. So N is the number of training points. If N is the number of training points, K can be chosen as square root of N. Okay. The other important component within our algorithm is the distance metrics. So for the distance metrics, the key things to know are there are various distance measures, but we will now cover three distance measures. One is the Euclidean distance, where you are fundamentally taking in the point between two points, xi and yi are two different points. You've taken a difference between them and you've squared it. You've summed up all the elements in those vectors because both are vectors and you've taken a square root of them. So this is a Euclidean distance very very basic distance measure now there is one more distance measure which you will commonly see which is called the manhattan or the city block distance which actually moves axis parallel it either moves horizontal or parallel that's what the manhattan or the city block distance does and the formulation for that is it's xi minus y in an absolute term gets summed up the other distance measure, which generalizes these two, is called Minskovsky distance, which targets to look at the same xi and yi, but now you have an r element in the formulation. So if it's two, then it becomes Euclidean. If it is one, it becomes city block, but it can also be varying, not necessarily one or two. Okay, that's what Minskovsky's observations were. Now. Things to keep in mind is, before we start using any of the distance measures, it's very important for us to convert our data into z-score and normalize them. Okay. So one of the transformations is a z-transformation, which is a z-score transformation, which is shown here, where you've taken a difference with the mean of that data series by the standard deviation of the data series. And this fundamentally normalizes the units. It makes the your features unit free. So this is very important to do before you use any of the distance measure. And then one more important thing to know is that Euclidean distance, even though it is very simple and is being widely used, comes around with its own sets of problems, which is it does not operate very well in the high dimensional data. So if you have way too many features, it's not going to operate fine. If you, if you actually have two features that are like this given in the example, then they are actually going to have the same distance measure. So there is a shrinking density, which is also called the sparsification effect. So it can produce counterintuitive results because of this distance measure referring to the same number, even though the actual values are significantly different. Okay, That's some stuff that we need to keep in mind when we're using Euclidean measure. But do use other measures like Manhattan measures or Minskovsky when you are uh, not able to use Euclidean for your data set. The third important point for us to note is distances for nominal data. So far we have spoken about continuous data where we have been given an array. But now we have an array with, with nominal data. Then the best approach known right now is we use a nominal attributed uh, distance measure, which is what we have listed here. So what it really does is it counts the number of times a particular nominal attribute A with a particular value X has shown up in a particular class divided by the number of times it is shown up with X value. Okay, So this would give us for each feature what sort of a value and what sort of class it's fallen into. And you subtract that with the others feature set for which you want to calculate the distance and in this particular case it is the same feature but then different value y for the given class okay after you've taken these differences these differences already are percentage differences because this gives you the percentage of a attribute being x and this gives you the percentage of a's value attribute being y after you've taken the difference in these percentages 
summed up, I mean, after you've taken the difference, squared and summed it up for you to get the nominal attributions. Now, this one, okay. Now, a few things to keep in mind is that that we will cover in the next video are the complexity, particularly around dimensions, storage, and computation of KNN. And also, we'll look at how to optimize for those complexities through the condensed KNN and KD trees. Okay. Until then, good luck to you.